The Confident Years, 1953 to 1964, Chapter 28. Uh, this is a very long chapter. It covers, although it covers a lot. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do the whole chapter. I'm going to stop at 1960 and continue. I get page uh, 797. Uh, righteousness like a mighty stream, the struggle for civil rights. I want to get all the civil rights movement in the 60s in one fell swoop. So we'll go through 1960. Stop, and then next lesson we'll pick up the last few pages of this chapter and go on into chapter 29. And that being said, a golden age of capitalism followed World War II, in which economic expansion, stable prices, low or non-existent unemployment, and a rising standard of living characterized the American economic life into well into the 1970s. In every measurable way, most Americans lived better than their parents and grandparents had. And by 1960, a majority of Americans were defined by the government as being middle class. And the poverty rate had dropped to one in five families. Of course, we have all those new innovations like television, and we even have color television now. Air conditioners, dishwashers, very cheap long distance phone calls. And we have jet travel. And we came to believe that we could use what used to be considered luxuries, you know, like electricity and indoor plumbing, they've become very common features for most Americans. And although the economics of the Western Europe and Japan had recovered after the war, the United States remained the world's industrial superpower. Major industries like steel and automobile and aircraft, they dominated the American and the world markets. And like other wars, the Cold War increased industrial production and redistributed the population and resources. The West became a center of military technology and production. The South housed military bases and shipyards. And in New England, new aircraft and submarine production replaced some of the jobs lost by the government, by the movement, excuse me, not the government, by the movement of the textile industry to the South. But the 1950s were, in fact, the last years of Americans' industrial age. Ever since then, our economy has moved towards services and education, information, finance, and entertainment, while employment in manufacturing has dropped. Union-led wage raises caused many employers to turn to mechanization in order to help reduce labor costs if they didn't send them out of the country. The number of farms in America declined as well, even as new technologies and irrigation increased agriculture production. But changes in the southern agriculture continued to reduce the number of agricultural workers, three million of whom, both black and white, left the South. But what most spurred economic growth in the 1950s was the housing industry, housing construction and spending on consumer goods. The post-war baby boom and population migration from cities to the suburbs created demand for housing, a demand for televisions and, and appliances and cars. So by 1960, there was more suburban residents of single-family homes from people living in than there were people living in urban and rural areas. In the 1950s, the number of houses had doubled, most of which were built in the suburbs. And many Americans could now realize the dreams of owning their own home by purchasing an inexpensive home in what we call a housing development. Now this is what we call Levitt Town, and it was built by a man named Levitt. Big deal, right? It was a mass-produced suburban housing development, and it symbolized basically the post-World War II sub 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 suburban <laughs> suburbanization. Ah, excuse me. Levitt Towns, uh, they're they were all called Levitt Towns, even though Levitt didn't build them all. They're usually positioned just outside of the city, and uh, it's convenient, it's inexpensive. And like I say, uh, Levitt Town got its name from Levitt and the Sons, and were constructed, the beginning of them, between 47 and 51. And the first was in Nassau County, New York, about 30 miles east of Manhattan. And because there was such a shortage in the housing after World War II, he came up with this idea of mass construction. I think you could build up seven houses in one day or something ridiculous. But they had four floor plans and each one had a covered carport. There was no basement and no appliances. But the suburbs were often centered around malls. 
which were accessible by cars and were used only for shopping and other private activities, unlike the city centers with multiple uses. But California is a little bit different. And I guess you'd say it best symbolized the post-war suburban boom. Between World War II and 1975, more than 30 million Americans moved west of the Mississippi River. Now, one-fifth of the 1950s population growth happened in California. And in 63, it even surpassed New York as the most populous state. But we call them centerless western cities. And like Houston and Phoenix and L.A., they were decentralized clusters of single-family homes and businesses tied together by highways. Unlike your eastern cities with central business districts and surrounding residential areas united by public transportation. In these new suburbs, life revolved around the car. People drove to work and they drove to shop. And the sad thing is, is that the older city centers began to stagnate. The suburban homes required lawns. So much so that today, more land area in the United States is cultivated in grass than in agricultural crops. But affluence and consumerism had never before so pervaded American society. In a consumer culture, freedom became the ability to satisfy your market's desires. And the 1950s was the accumulation of a long-term trend in which consumerism replaced economic independence and democratic participation as central definitions of American freedom. Americans were now happily going about accumulating debt in order to maintain a consumer lifestyle. Television, especially, began to spread the culture of the middle class life and consumerism. And by the 1960s, almost all American families owned a TV set and television began to replace newspapers as the most common informational source about public events, whereas today you get your information on your phone or your iPad. But TV became the nation's primary leisure activity also. It changed our habits and offered most Americans, uh, it didn't matter where you were from, any background, you could have a common experience. And TV programming always avoided controversy and depicted a humdrum middle class existence and I don't know if you have seen any of the I Love Lucy shows on uh, Nick at Night or anything, but I mean, they had to sleep in twin beds. And if a man sat on the bed that the woman was laying in, he had to have it both feet on the floor. Very prim and proper. It usually depicted a rather humdrum middle class existence, basically. And they featured the uh, urban working class families. Of course, later, the popularity of those declined, and we started having quiz shows and westerns and comedies, but they were always set in the suburbs, like Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, and TV became the most effective advertising medium. It sold goods, it spread an, Im spread an image of a good life, one based on consumer goods. You can also use your TV as a babysitter, and I'm ashamed to admit I did do that. But buying a new car soon seemed essential to freedom. It goes right along with consumerism. And along with the home and TV, a car became a consumer necessity for each family. In 1960, four of five families in the United States owned at least one car. Almost always made in the United States. Oh, those were the days, folks. Big cars, gas guzzlers, but they were all made here. Auto manufacturers and oil companies became the top companies in America. Detroit became the center of the automobile industry and it supported enormous factories, with some of them with more than 40,000 employees or more. I guess you could say the car transformed American life. And as you can see, we had the drive-in movies and you had McDonald's hamburgers, 15 cents for a hamburger from McDonald's, not bad, huh? Wartime, we wanted our women to go do the job the man left behind. But in peacetime, we want her in the kitchen. Suburbanization reinforced the family as the center of the, uh, shall we say, American way of life in women's household roles. And most women who had had the industrial jobs during the war, of course, lost them. 
and most women who worked outside the home had to stay unfortunately in low paid non-union jobs because the better paid factory jobs were going to the men. Although the number of women at work slowly rose, uh, more women worked to supplement their family's consumer lifestyle than for economic independence. And their pay was, by 1960, on the average about 60% of what a man would earn. It was widely assumed that the suburban family's breadwinner should be the male, while the wife stayed at home. In popular culture depicted marriage as the most important life goal of the American woman, and women married younger, divorced less, and had more children. Now, I am going to put this, I think, up as an attachment. But, um, back in the day, we used to have home ec classes in the 1950s. And in one of our home ec books, we were told to read this to learn how to, we learned how to cook and how to make aprons and how to be a good wife. And they gave us a list of things that we should do to have a good life, a good marriage. We're assuming we're married. And so uh, this is your job, ladies. When the husband comes home, you're going to have dinner ready because you planned ahead even as much as the night before. And you want to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. Because this is a way of letting him know that you must be thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Because most men are hungry when they come home and the prospect of a good meal is part of the warm welcome needed. Meanwhile, before this happens, you should prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup, put a ribbon in your hair, and be fresh looking. Because he has just been with a lot of work-weary people. And be a little gay. A little more interesting for him. His boring day may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide it. One of your duties. Clear away the clutter. Make one last trip to the house, part of the house, just before your husband uh, comes from home and run a dust cloth over the tables. And over the cooler months of the year, you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. After all, caring for his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. You should also minimize all noise. At the time of his arrival, uh, you know, make sure the dishwasher is on, don't have the vacuum cleaner going, Encourage your children to be quiet and act like you're happy to see him. You greet him with a warm smile and show sincerity in your desire to please him. Then you listen to him. Now you may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Make the evening his. Never complain if he comes home late or he goes out to dinner or other places of entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of strain and pressure and his very real need to be at home and relax. So your goal is to try and make sure your home is a place of peace, order, and tranquility where your husband can renew himself in body and spirit. Don't greet him with complaints and problems. Make him comfortable. Have him lean back in a comfortable chair or have him lie down in the bedroom. Have a cool or a warm drink ready for him and arrange his pillow and offer to take off his shoes. Speak in a low, soothing, and pleasant voice. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. You see, a good wife always knows her place. <clears throat> Biting my tongue right now, ladies and gentlemen. I hate to admit it, but that's the type of thing that we were taught back in the 50s. Uh, mm, okay. Nowadays, you make sure that the uh, food is prepared at the drive-in window at McDonald's before you go home. <laughs> mm. A baby boom lasted from the war's end to the mid-1960s, and it contributed to about 30 million increase in the nation's population in the 1950s. And the family became a weapon in the Cold War, because government officials argued uh, women's confinement to the home separated the free world from the communist world, because over there women worked. 
and feminism seems to have disappeared from American life and culture. But the suburbs offered the dream of homeownership and security to millions of Americans who suffered through the Depression and war. It also promoted Americanization. Because as it, the, the, the ethnic, ethnic Americans left the urban enclaves and joined an American of mass consumption. But the suburbs were racially segregated. Although they differed in many ways, uh, suburbs were almost always white. The racial segregation of the suburbanization was a result of decisions by the government, the real estate developers, the banks, and the residents. Within that post-war housing boom, government officials encouraged mortgages that barred resale to non-whites. And when the Supreme Court declared this was unconstitutional, private banks and developers continued the same practice. Although Congress in 49 passed a law to build almost a million units of public housing, the law set a very low ceiling on residents' income in order to limit competition for the construction of middle-class housing. This limited housing project to the very poor. And along with the fact that white urban and suburban neighborhoods opposed the construction of public housing, this reinforced the poverty of the urban non-white areas. Urban renewal also demolished the poor neighborhoods and city centers in order to develop shopping centers in all white middle income residential areas and state university campuses were white. Whites displaced by the urban renewal often moved to the suburbs while the non-whites, because of lack of money, were unable to leave the inner city so they had to stay. Suburbanization reinforced a big racial division in America. Between 1950 and 1970, almost 7 million whites left the city's fourth suburbs, while 3 million blacks moved from the south to the north, expanding and creating the urban ghettos. Half a million Puerto Ricans, many of them small farmers and laborers, had been pushed off their islands by the sugar companies when they moved to the mainland, and most of them settled in New York City. But racial exclusion reinforced itself. Non-whites facing employment discrimination and exclusion from educational opportunities were confined to unskilled jobs. As whites and industrial jobs moved out of the cities, poor blacks and Latinos stayed in the urban ghettos and they became seen as seen as centers of crime and poverty and welfare. These suburban whites feared that any non-white presence in their neighborhood would lower the quality of their life and their property values. But in the 1950s, it seemed to many that America's major social problems had been solved. With widespread affluence and narrow political debate, it made for a kind of a nice, quiet, integrated society. Business booms and busts, mass unemployment and economic security seemed things of the past. So scholars celebrated the end of ideology and the victory of a democratic capitalistic, capitalistic consensus. But all Americans, except a few fanatics, shared the same liberal values of individualism, respect for private property, and belief in equal opportunity. Uh, religious differences now seemed absorbed into a com common Judeo Christian heritage in which Catholics, Protestants, and Jews all shared history and values and contributed to American society. And freedom of religion was held to, was to differentiate America from the anti religious Soviet Union. And although the Judeo Christian concept obscured the long standing history of religious strife in American life, it reflected the decline of anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism in the United States and the increasing secularization of the entire nation. And although a majority of Americans were affiliated with a church or synagogue in the 50s, the highest portion in American history, religion had, well, it had more to do with personal identity and group assimilation and promoting traditional morality than it had to do with spiritual activity. The Cold War's freedom, economic content became centered uh, on consumer capitalism or free enterprise. An economic system based on private ownership united the nations of the free world more than political democracy or freedom of speech. 
Even President Truman dropped freedom from want and fear from his speeches and replaced them with freedom of enterprise. And this selling of free enterprise kind of became a major industry that involved advertising and school programs and newspaper editorials and civic activities. Yet talk of the virtue of free markets ignored how government policies like federal tax subsidies, mortgage guarantees, infrastructure construction, military contracts, and GI Bill benefits all spurred the post-war economic growth. Now, although Americans had long worried that big business threatened their liberties, they were now told by the government officials to embrace large-scale production as a way to fight the Cold War and enhance freedom by spreading consumer goods. Like I said, freedom was defined essentially as freedom of choice for the consumer. But to many Americans, we seem to have become a classless society. A steep rise in the number of people invested in Wall Street inspired people to talk of a people's capitalism. And few could deny that affluence seemed to make, well, poverty kind of becomes a relic of history, or so it would seem. In the 1950s, a few intellectuals began to revive conservatism and reclaim uh, from the liberals the idea of freedom. Their ideas eventually defined conservative thought for the rest of the 20th century. And their opposition to a strong national government was fostered by resentments against the New Deal. These people called libertarian conservatives, well, they defined freedom as individual autonomy, limited government, and unregulated capitalism. Their principles appealed to conservative entrepreneurs, especially in the developing South and West, and many businessmen looking to earn profits free of government regulation, uh, laissez-faire, government hands-off, free from high taxes and free from unions. And they began to admire the writings of a man called Milton Freedom, Freeman, a young economist, although that picture side of him being young. In 1962, he published Capitalism and Freedom, which identified the free market as the foundation of individual liberty. He gave this rather popular idea an extreme logic. He called for privatizing almost all government functions and for the repeal of minimum wage laws and the graduated income tax and social conservatives. He also wanted to uh, repeal Social Security. He criticized not only liberalization, but the new conservatism, another growing body of the 1950s, believing that the free world had to be morally and intellectually and not just militarily. He defended against communism and writers, which we do not have to remember their names, of course, Russell Kirk and Richard Weaver argued that liberals toleration of differences was no substitute for the search for absolute truth. They called for a return to a civilization based on Christian values. They understood freedom as a moral condition above all, in which the individual was responsible for their own action and could be coerced by the government if they did not make the right decisions. Although the libertarian conservatism and the new conservatives disagreed about priorities and the definition of freedom seems to change from decade to decade, they both united against the Soviet Union and liberalism at home. Conservatism in America was now defined by its opposition to big government. Dwight David Eisenhower, of course we knew him as Ike, one of the most popular military figures to emerge from the World War II. He supported President Truman's candidacy for President in 48 and 52. And both parties, Republican and Democratic, wanted him to be their candidate. But he believed that a contender for the Republican nomination, Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio, would turn America back to isolationism. And Eisenhower managed to gain the Republican nomination, he said, to stop him. He chose as his running mate a young man from California named Richard Nixon, who was also a member of the House Un-American Activities Committee and had achieved quite a bit of notoriety through his anti-communist activism, particularly going against Alger Hess. Nixon won a Senate seat in 50 by suggesting that his Democratic opponents sympathized with communism. 
though Nixon gained a reputation for opportunism and dishonesty. But he was a very skillful politician who he did lead efforts to change the Republican Party's image from defender of business to champion of the forgotten man. Champion of the hardworking citizens that were burdened by heavy taxes and government bureaucracy. The 1952 presidential campaign was the first to show how television changed politics. The candidates crafted their images and they were projected directly into the American's living room. Of course, Eisenhower's popularity, popularity dominated the election, especially with his frustration with the Korean War. And Eisenhower's pledge to bring peace won him an overwhelming victory over Adlai Stevenson, the Democratic candidate. Four years later, Eisenhower again bested Stevenson by an even larger margin. But the Republicans didn't gain full control of Congress in 54. The Democrats regained control of Congress and held it for the rest of the 1950s. Voters across the world elected familiar and elder statesmen to government, such as Winston Churchill, who was made Prime Minister of England again, and General Charles de Gaulle began to rule France again. With a Republican president after a long period of Democratic rule, Businesses, once again, were heavily influenced by Washington and the executive branch. Ike, an ally of business and physical conservative, worked to reduce government spending, including the military budget. But while some Republicans wanted to roll back the New Deal totally, Ike knew that would be political suicide. His domestic agenda he called the modern republicanism. And it was intended to end the Republicans' association with Herbert Hoover, the Depression, and social indifference. So under Eisenhower, this New Deal programs expanded and the size of the government grew, which is what the Republicans are supposed to be against. Now, free enterprise may have been a potent American weapon in the Cold War, but the mixed economy, in which government is playing a very big role in planning economic activity, yeah, it was popular in the West especially with U.S. allies like Britain and France, and they start expanding welfare and nationalized key industries like steel, shipbuilding, and transportation. But the United States had a smaller welfare state than in Western Europe and left major industries in private hands, while government spending, such as the creation of a national highway system, boosted productivity and employment. This beautiful highway system uh, has been called the greatest public works project in history. Now, Ike, when he was in the military and stationed in Germany, he had seen the Audubon, and he was very, very impressed. Uh, he managed to get it passed, because we got all these people in the suburbs now, right? And he managed to get the Federal Aid Highway Act of 56 passed. And whether you want to believe it or not, you've all been touched by it, if not directly, then indirectly, because every item we buy has been on the interstate system at some point. Eisenhower considered it one of the most important achievements of his two terms in office, and historians agree with him. But they weren't built for the convenience of people living in the suburbs. They were built for a way to uh, move troops from one area to the other in case of war, uh, to be able to land an airplane on them if the airports were bombed, uh, evacuation of cities. Uh, he was thinking militarily. The 1950s also saw stability in labor relations because that 1947 Taft-Hartley Act reduced mil labor mil militancy. And in 55, the AFL and CIO merged into one organization which represented 35% of all non-farm workers. In key industries, labor and management established what has been called well, yeah, a new social contract. Unions left decisions about capital investment, plant location, and output to managers and agreed to suppress unauthorized wildcat strikes. In return for the employer's acceptance of the unions, the wage increases, and the fringe benefits like private pensions and health insurance and automatic adjustments to cover rises in living costs, you know, the uh, cost of living increase, COLA. Though unionized workers shared in 1950s prosperity, the social contract applied to really relatively few workers. Unions did win increases in the minimum wage, but that did little for the non-union worker. Most workers did not enjoy the wages and benefits of unions. 
Non-union employees continued to combat labor unions, and some firms still moved production to a cheaper non-union south or out of the country. A 1959 strike provoked by the steel companies in an attempt to reduce the union's power of production showed that by the 1960s, that social contract was kind of weakening. But once elected, Eisenhower quickly ended the Korean War. But the Cold War tensions increased. In 1952, the United States exploded the first hydrogen bomb, which is even more destructive than the atomic bomb. In the next year, the Soviets did the same thing, because they had their hydrogen bomb, too. And now both powers are beginning to build long-range bombers capable of delivering these nuclear weapons anywhere in the world. Now, although Eisenhower was a professional soldier, he hated war. But his Secretary of State, John Bostard Dulles, relished it. And in 1954, Dulles updated U.S. containment policy with his doctrine of massive retaliation. Mm. This policy stated that any Soviet attack on a U.S. ally would be met with a nuclear assault on the Soviet Union. Wow. This new focus on nuclear weapons with Eisenhower reduced spending on conventional military forces. During his presidency, the size of the armed forces dropped, while the number of nuclear weapons increased dramatically to about 18,000. So massive retaliation seemed to risk that even a small conflict would rapidly escalate into a nuclear war that could destroy the United States and the Soviet Union. The critics have called it brinkmanship, but the reality that war could result in a mutually assured destruction made the U.S. and the USSR a little bit cautious. It also spread fear of an imminent nuclear war, and the government appeals to the public to build bomb shelters in their backyards and there were school drills where students would hide under the desk, and this was meant to convince the Americans that they could survive a nuclear war. But in reality, it only increased widespread fear. Let's face facts. If you have an atomic bomb dropped on you, you just might as well turn around and kiss your derriere goodbye. This is a picture of a supposedly bomb shelter, uh, table, chairs, well, very well stocked, but uh, mm -mm. Eisenhower embraced Cold War rhetoric, but he believed that the Korea's war's end and Stalin's death in 53 signaled that the Soviets were reasonable and they could be reached through normal diplomacy. So in 1955, he met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in Switzerland. And Nikita Khrushchev had become the Premier of the Soviet Union after Joseph Stalin's death in 53. And in a 1956 secret speech, he discussed Stalin's crimes for the first time, starting a process called de-Stalinization. He also then visited the West, putting a smiling face on his brand of reform communism. But he also provoked the Cuban Missile Crisis and oversaw the building of the Berlin Wall. That same year, Khrushchev called for peaceful coexistence. So was this a thaw in the Cold War? Well, it ended when the Soviet troops suppressed an anti-communist revolt in Hungary. And while some Republicans called for liberating Europe, I did not aid the Hungarian rebels. He did not believe it was possible to roll back Soviet power in Eastern Europe. And in 1958, the United States and the USSR agreed to halt nuclear weapon testing. Well, this only lasts for a couple of years, but a couple of years is a couple of years. In 1959, Khrushchev, Khrushchev even toured the U.S. and met with Eisenhower. But in 1960, well, tensions kind of rose up again when the Soviets shot down a U.S. spy plane over Soviet territory. Now, even though the Cold War is permanently dividing Europe into communist and capitalistic regions without a war, it's sparking competition and military conflict in what came to be called the Third War, Third World, which was the word they used to describe the developing countries that were aligned with neither the U.S. or the USSR. But they wanted to develop their economies without central government planning or free market capitalism. There was a conference held in Indonesia in 1955 that brought together the leaders of 29 African and Asian nations 
and is seen to mark the arrival of the Third World in international affairs. And all these countries, of course, were strongly affected by the Cold War between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. But in this cold post-war period, Europe's empires are crumbling. Decolonization in Asia and Africa began when India and Pakistan achieved independence in 47. In the late 1950s, other new nations such as Guyana, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, and even Kenya followed. By 1975, even Portugal, which had created Europe's first modern overseas empire, empire gave independence to its African colonies, Mozambique and Angola. Facing decolonization, the U.S. feared that power vacuums in the former colonies would be, well, penetrated by Soviet allied communists. The Soviets supported the dissolution of Europe's colonial power, and communists participated in national movements for independence. Leaders of these new nations often saw socialism in one form or another as the best means to economic independence and narrowing the social inequalities created by imperialism. Now, while most new third world nations sided with neither power, the United States was admired by many nationalists for its own struggle for colonial independence because we had that war against England. Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader of the Vietnam's movement to end the French rule there, modeled his 1945 Declaration of Nationhood on our own Declaration of Independence. So this containment policy very soon created U.S. opposition to any government, whether communist or not, which appeared to threaten the U.S. strategic or economic interest. Although the leader in Guatemala and in Iran were elected as homegrown nationalists and were not Soviet agents, the determination to end foreign cooperation's domination of their economies, well, it kind of ticked the Americans off and kind of take, they provoked an American intervention. Land reforms that threatened the domination of the uh, Guatemalan economy, we had had a pretty high hand. We were kind of running, but if they nationalize everything, eh, not going to work. The United Fruit Company owned the land, and it did not like what was happening. The Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, whose refinery in Iran was Britain's largest overseas asset, hmm, they were going to nationalize them too. Of course, their enemies branded them as communists in 53 and 54. Our own CIA orchestrated coups against both governments in violation of the UN Charter, by the way. In 1956, Israel, Britain, and France invaded Egypt. The country's nationalist leader, Gamal Abdul Nasser, had nationalized the Suez Canal, which had been owned by Britain and France. Well, Eisenhower forced them to abandon the invasion, and soon the United States replaced Britain as the dominant Western power in the Middle East, with American firms dominating the region's oil fields. In 1957, Eisenhower extended containment policy to the Middle East and issued the Eisenhower Doctrine, which committed the United States to defend Middle Eastern governments threatened by communism or Arabian nationalism. In Vietnam in 1945, when the Japanese were expelled, the French moved to crush a nationalist independent movement led by a man named Ho Chi Minh and reassert its own colonial rule. Anti-communism pulled the United States deeper into involvement, especially in Southeast Asia following a policy set by Truman. Eisenhower gave billions of dollars in aid to the French, but by the early 1950s, the United States was paying for four-fifths of the cost of the France's war in Vietnam. But we didn't send any troops in. 54. When French forces were on the verge of defeating, being defeated, uh, the National Security Council advised the president to use nuclear weapons. Eisenhower said, no, I don't think so. So it left France with no choice but to concede Vietnamese independence. 
peace conference divided Vietnam into North and South until both the elections held. But the leader in the South, uh, an anti-communist leader now called uh, Naj Bidem, B I E M, at the suggestion of the United States, refused to hold elections, which both parties knew would result in a communist victory. Nadim was Catholic, and his ties were very strong to the landlords in a country of small farmers, and the Buddhists alienated him. Uh, if it hadn't been for the U.S. and his aid, his regime wouldn't have lasted a day and a half. So by 1960, Diem faced a guerrilla war launched by the communist-led National Liberation Front. So events in Guatemala, Iran, and Vietnam set a trend in our foreign relations. And we became accustomed to intervention, both overt and covert, throughout the world. And despite Cold War language of freedom, U.S. leaders again and again allied with military regimes rather than democratic governments. And we have this horrible track record of taking the wrong government back. But in Guatemala, a series of military regimes ended reforms and began a period of repression in which about 200,000 Guatemalans died. In Iran, the Shah, who had replaced the gov elected government there, uh, and gave U.S. and British companies 40% of all Iranian oil reserves, and he remained in office until 1979 when a revolution ushered in a radical Islamic national government. In Vietnam, the U.S. support for Diem led to the most disastrous war in the United States history. But despite the apparent rule of consensus in American society, in which McCarthyism had made criticism of the status quo seem disloyal, in which freedom seemed to be located in the private enjoyment of consumer goods, and in which political debate was narrowed by the Cold War. Dissent did exist. Some intellectuals who uh, thought that inf influence in the Cold War mentality obscured the degree to which the United States did not live up to its own ideal of freedom. In 57, political scientist Hans Mortenau argued that free enterprise had created new accumulations of power that threatened individual liberty. And of course, the radical soci sociologist C. Wright Mills challenged the idea that democratic pluralism defined American life and argued that America was ruled by a power elite, an interlocking directorate of corporate leaders, politicians, and military men who were dominating the government and society in making political democracy obsolete and define, denying real freedom of choice to any Americans. Now, some argue that modernity, modernity itself produced psychological and cultural discontent, and they worried that mass society produced a loneliness and anxiety that made people desire not freedom, but authority and stability. Social scientists and critics argued that Americans were conformists who were unable to be independent thinkers and actors, and that corporate bureaucracies turned employees into organized men incapable of independent thought. Other critics worried that Americans had lost their commitment to the common good. Inter economist, economist John Kenneth Galbraith, in his book The Affluent Society, in which he wondered how American society could neglect investment in schools and parks and public services while producing ever more goods to satisfy consumer desires. Other books criticize the monopoly of modern work, the emptiness of suburban life, and the influence of advertising. But the social and cultural critique did little to transform the American life in the 1950s. Because these critics, critics did not offer a political alternative or influence party politics or government. So with a very large and growing young population, thanks to the baby boom, popular culture began to reveal tensions in the quiet surface of the 1950s life. J.D. Salinger's novel Catcher in the Rye, 1951, films like Rebel Without a Cause in 1955, they begin to emphasize the alienation of the youth from the adult world. And such work stimulated adult fears of widespread juvenile delinquency, 
yet had even comic book publishers to regulate their publications. Indeed, cultural life was more daring than politics. Teenagers were beginning to wear leather jackets and they danced to rock and roll music. It brought the, the hard rhythm and sexually provocative movements of black musicians and dancers to the white audiences. And it embodied nothing embodied it more than the extremely popular Elvis Presley. And of course, there was a debut of that uh, magazine called Playboy, openly flaunting a fantasy world of sexuality for men outside their family and gay men and lesbians. Although they were considered deviant by the larger society, established their own subculture in America's major cities. In New York, San Francisco, and even some small college town, the Beats, a small group of poets and writers, rebelled against the mainstream culture. The term beat was invented by the novelist Jack Kerouac, and it signified beaten down and beatified or something of that effect. In his book On the Road, written in the early 1950s, but not published until 57, it captured the aimless wanderings of the main character across America in a spontaneous series of sights, sounds, and images. The book kind of captivated a generation of young people who rejected middle-class life, but offered no alternative. Likewise, Allen Ginsberg Howell, written while the author was taking hallucinogenic drugs, was a sprawling poem that railed against materialism and conformatism. Now, like the French Impressionist artists of Paris, the beat writers were a small group of close friends first and a movement later, and they rejected the work ethic. They rejected suburban middle class materialism. They rejected the Cold War's militarization of American life, but they celebrated compulsive action. They celebrated immediate gratification, often enhanced with drugs, and of course sexual experimentation. But the most significant challenge in the 1950s was the greatest citizens movement of the 20th century, the black struggle for equality. The civil rights movement, though celebrated today, was at the time a kind of a surprise. The causes today seem apparent, uh, from, you know, from the World War II destabilization of the racial system and the mass migration out of the South that made black voters a larger part of the democratic coalition, to the Cold War and the rise of the independent Third World. All of these exposed the gap between U.S. rhetoric and realities. But few, if anybody, ever predicted that a mass movement for civil rights would develop in the South. A few thought a movement might develop in the North, but their black allies and black groups had been damaged by McCarthyism and limited by the racism of union leaders and the exclusivity of legal strategy of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Southern movement instead had its basis in the Southern Black Church, which organized a militant but nonviolent assault on segregation. In the 1950s, the United States was still a very segregated and unequal society. Half of America's black families lived in poverty. And because of the seniority rules that protected white workers in the industrial workforce, blacks lost their jobs first when the, econ when the economy went south. Or, <laughs> that's as an expression, I shouldn't be using this. They went uh, sour. In the South, Jim Crow laws characterized all kinds of separate public institutions. And in the North and the West, not law, but custom. Barred blacks from colleges and hotels and restaurants and most suburban housing. In the 1950, uh, 17 southern and border states and Washington, D.C. required the racial segregation of public schools, and several more states allowed local districts to segregate. And few whites felt it was urgent to challenge this inequality. And with the defeat of Truman's Civil Rights Initiative and then Eisenhower's administration reluctant to confront race relations and segregation, it was attacked in the courts. In California, a challenge to segregation there by Latino groups led to the desegregation of public schools in 1946. And the governor who signed the measure, Earl Warren, had presided over the Japanese-American internment. But after the war, he came to oppose racial inequality. 
Now, Eisenhower appointed Warren as the Supreme Court's Chief Justice in 53. Meanwhile, the NAACP, led by attorney, young attorney Thurgood Marshall, continued its campaign of legal challenges to this separate but equal doctrine. And by 1950, the Supreme Court ruling in several cases suggested that segregated institutions of higher education for blacks were not actually equal to those open only to whites. Marshall soon directly attacked racial segregation in public education. The NAACP worked on several cases in challenging the unequal treatment of black children in schools across the country. In 1955, 52, I'm sorry, five of these cases were combined into a single appeal whose title was the first case listed, Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. Marshall attacked, but not the unfair application of the separate but equal doctrine, but the doctrine itself. He argued that even with the same funding and facilities, segregation was in unequal because it stigmatized one group of citizens as unfit to association associate with the others. And using psychological studies, Marshall stated that segregation inflected, inflect, inflicted lifelong damage on the black children by undermining their self-esteem. The Eisenhower administration, in a brief on the case, urged the court to recognize the damage segregation inflicted on American's reputation abroad in the context of the Cold War. And the new Chief Justice, Earl Warren, read the unanimous decision on May the 17th of 54, which stated that segregation in public education violated the equal protections of the law guaranteed by the 14th Amendment thus striking down the separate but equal doctrine protecting segregation. The South is beginning to see the handwriting on the wall big time. Although hailed by the black press as a second emancipation proclamation, the decision did not outlaw segregation in institutions other than public schools or did it ban racial classifications in the law. It did not address a de facto school segregation in the North, based on residential segregation rather than state law. In other words, you had to go to a school that's close to where you lived. It did not order immediate implementation. 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 But only hearings on how segregation in schools should be abolished. But the Brown decision signaled, like I said, the beginnings of the Warren Court as an active agent of social change, and it did give hope to many that segregation might soon end. School segregation bans. The Brown decision animated civil rights activists who, after being rather dormant in the early 50s, now believed that federal courts would back them. And mass reaction against the Jim Crow laws developed very quickly. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks, a black department store worker in Montgomery, Alabama, refused to surrender her seat on a city bus to a white rider, and the local law required that. Ms. Park's arrest provoked a year-long bus boycott, which initiated the mass phase of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And within a decade, the Civil Rights Revolution overthrew legal segregation and regained the right to vote for black Southerners. Now, Parks was depicted as an ordinary woman fed up with Jim Crow. And I did not know until I returned to college many years later that she was a veteran civil rights worker. She'd worked in the 30s and 40s. But when news of her arrest spread through Montgomery, hundreds of blacks gathered in a local church and refused to ride the bus until they received equal treatment. And for more than a year, desperate harassment and violence, Montgomery's blacks boycotted the buses. In November of 1956, the Supreme Court ruled segregation and public transportation unconstitutional. The Montgomery Best Boycott launched a nonviolent involvement and movement for racial justice based, and it started in the South Black churches. But it was supported by Northern liberals and it focused unprecedented international attention on the U.S. racial policies. And throughout the boycott, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. 
a young pastor at a local Baptist church, became the movement's symbol. And at the boycott's first protest meeting, uh, protest meeting, King inspired his audience when he said that Southern blacks were tired of going through the long night of captivity. And they were, quote, reaching out for the daybreak of freedom and justice and equality, unquote. But from the beginning, the language of freedom marked the black movement. Freedom meant many different things, but most of all, it meant political rights and economic economic opportunities long denied because of skin color. King's rhetoric united the ideas of freedom into a coherent whole. In his most famous speech, I Have a Dream, given in 63, began by noting the unfulfilled promises of emancipation and closed by invoking a cry from a black spiritual, which has come to be a symbol of their movement, free at last, thank God, free at last. King appealed to both black sense of injustice and the consciousness of the white America by making the case for black rights in terms that united blacks' experiences with that of the nation. A student of nonviolent civil disobedience, as proposed by Henry David Thoreau and Gandhi, King offered a philosophy of struggle in which evil was met by good. Hate was met with Christian love and violence with peaceful demands for change. His Christian themes came from the black church and they resonated in the black community and throughout America. He appealed to white America by emphasizing blacks' loyalty to the nation and their devotion to its redemptive values. In 56, building on the success they'd had in Montgomery, King Ford formed something called the Southern Christian Leadership Congress, SCLC. It was a coalition of black ministers and civil rights activists. They were going to organize desegregation efforts. But the fact that Montgomery's official had agreed to desegregate only when forced to do by the Supreme Court showed that really more local action was necessary if they were going to end all Jim Crow laws. But the white South's refusal to accept the Brown decision showed that blacks would win their constitutional rights only by federal intervention. But the federal government, it, it didn't step up. Southern whites did. They launched a campaign of massive resistance. In 56, a full 82 of 106 Southern congressmen signed a Southern Manifesto which condemned Brown as an abuse of judicial power and calling for lawful resistance to the forced integration. They did say that <coughs> in their speeches that do everything that's legal. <coughs> hint, hint. Wink, wink. And southern states very soon began to pass laws to block desegregation. They even went so far as to outlaw the NAACP because it was a radical group calling for change and not conforming to they must be communists. Uh, Virginia was the first state to enact desegregation, but they did offer funds to white students and not to blacks to attend a private school if they desired. And of course some localities shut down their schools altogether rather than desegregate. The federal government tried to stay uninvolved and in 1957 Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson led a successful effort in Congress to pass the first national civil rights law since Reconstruction. It focused on black voters' rights in the South, but it had weak enforcement. And that's the same way with anything. You can pass all the laws you want to, but if you're not, well, not going to enforce the laws, they aren't worth the paper they're written on. President Eisenhower offered no moral leadership and called only for Americans to obey the law well, he very publicly made clear he did not welcome this civil rights agitation. Meanwhile, again in 1957, Governor Orville Paulus of Arkansas, he used his National Guard to prevent the court-ordered integration of Little Rock Central High School. And Eisenhower, much as he didn't want to, he was forced to dispatch federal troops to the city to enforce it. Elsewhere, the federal government did very little to hasten anything called desegregation. But since the Cold War's beginnings, U.S. leaders are starting to worry that segregation is tarnishing our reputation abroad. 
This continued all in, on into the late 50s. Moreover, we've got foreign nations and colonies also noticing the development of civil rights in America. And across the world, people of the African descent celebrated the Brown decision. But this slow pace of change was leading to embarrassment and criticisms of the American diplomats. But the presidential campaign of 1960 was one of the closest in American history. The Republican vice president from Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, faced off against a Democratic candidate, John F. Kennedy. Here we have JFK and we have Richard Tricky Dicky. John Kennedy was a Massachusetts senator and a Roman Catholic whose father had been the U.S. ambassador to Great Britain. LBJ ran as Kennedy's vice presidential candidate because they wanted to pull in some of the southern votes, and since he was from Texas, they figured they'd get that at least. Although World War II's atmosphere of tolerance had weakened anti Catholicism, it did persist in claims that the church was undemocratic, repressive, and un American. In many Protestants were weary of voting for Kennedy, uh, fearing that a Catholic president would follow the church dictates in controversial public policy issues rather than following the uh, state. He tried to dismiss such fears of JFK by disavowing any connection between his public position and his church. And Kennedy secured the Democratic nomination, and after he won the primary in the heavily, heavily Protestant West Virginia, then he was facing off against Nixon. As I said, John Kennedy was Catholic Massachusetts Senator. He was a World War II veteran. His father was a government man, uh, ambassador to Great Britain. He promised he'd keep his church and politics separate. And he had a young, beautiful wife and young children. And it was just a breath of fresh air coming into Washington. Richard M. Nixon was Protestant. He'd been Ike's VP uh, from California, a member of the House Un American Activities Committee. And when you saw his picture, he looked tired. And they had a TV debate, and it looked like Nixon needed to shave. And he wasn't articulate as JFK. He uh, was very knowledgeable in foreign affairs. That's where his strength lay. But by being slow in his answers and responses to Kennedy during the debate, it, Kennedy came across as being, you know, as sharp as a tack. Richard Nixon's, Pat Nixon, I uh, was. Well, she's a very quiet lady and a little bit mousy, as a matter of fact. But both candidates were very ardent cold warriors. But Kennedy argued that the Soviet Union's success in launching Sputnik, the first Earth satellite into orbit, and their tests of the first intercontinental ballistic missile showed that the U.S., under the Republicans, had let a missile gap develop, was lagging behind the USSR in the Cold War. Both Kennedy and Nixon knew that the U.S. military and economic capability was far greater than the Soviets, but Kennedy's criticisms convinced many Americans that new leadership was needed. And of course, Kennedy's very stylish wife, Jacqueline, oh, she charmed everybody. And she would go on television and take you on a tour of the White House. And she had this very soft spoken voice. I don't think she probably ever raised her voice. Very genteel. They liked the idea of the young, the energetic first lady. And I guess we all thought that much like we'd misjudged Eleanor Roosevelt we, uh, during World War II, we, when we hear uh, FDR's fireside chats, we assumed that Mrs. Roosevelt was in the kitchen baking cookies. I think we thought that uh, Mrs. Kennedy was washing out her own diapers and hanging on a clothesline in the White House backyard, but of course this wasn't what's going to happen. But in the first ever televised presidential debate, the very handsome Kennedy, he beat Nixon by the public vote, not so much by uh, substance of the debate. But Nixon, tired looking, and he seemed nervous, and looked like he needed a shave. Now, those who just listened on the radio thought Nixon had won the debate, but in fact, <laughs> Kennedy won by a very narrow margin. And when they actually had the presidential election, uh, thanks to the black vote, Kennedy won by a mere 120,000 votes.
January 1961, shortly before leaving office, President Eisenhower delivered a televised farewell address. He warned against the new military buildup and urged Americans to think about the dangers of what he called the military-industrial complex. They can join an enormous military establishment with a permanent arms industry, and it was greatly influencing politicians and policy. He warned that such an establishment should never endanger our liberties or democratic processes. But most Americans saw the military-industrial establishment not as a threat, but as a source of jobs and national security. The Vietnam War soon made Ike's words of caution seem very relevant. And by the 1960s, the foundations of the 1950s life seemed to be collapsing. Cars and the chemicals produced and released by new consumer goods were found to be spoiling the environment and giving people cancer. Housewives are rebelling against the roles given to them uh, as their suburban family. Blacks became impatient with the slow pace of racial progress, and the 1960s has arrived. And like I said, I'm going to stop in your text at the section called Righteousness Like a Mighty Stream, The Struggle for Civil Rights. And although it goes back and mentions a few things that happened in the 50s, it's basically going to tell you about uh, the Southern, the groups, the SNCC and uh, Southern Conference Leadership, CORE, Student for Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And get into the march on Washington and takes you up through 1964 before things start getting really, really violent. But like I said, we're going to com combine the last few pages of this chapter with the next chapter. So thank you for listening.